It is Wednesday afternoon, September 6th. We're picking up. We'll start fresh with Bereshit, Genesis chapter 26. Just a quick review here at the end of chapter 25. We were dealing with the time that Yaakov, Jacob, wanted to buy his birthright from Esau, who wanted to give it up for a bowl of lentils is what we realized it really should have been called he was not starving to death he didn't need to do that Yaakov wasn't taking advantage of him he even knew that God had said the birthright was to be his but in rather so as one of my sources said he tried to buy what was already his and Esau tried to sell what wasn't his to sell but uh, we know God is working behind the scenes in spite of man and his will will be done. So we put that story on hold while we enter into chapter 26. We'll pick that story back up in chapter 27 where the blessing and the birthright are being dealt with. Again, the blessing in particular, but the two go together. So we will look at that. We'll look at, again, what the birthright means and what's going on and who gets it and who was really in the wrong and who was really in the right. But in between this time, we have what's going on in Yitzhak's life, in Isaac's life. Remember, we walked for days with Avraham. In fact, in our case, we walked for weeks and months with Avraham. Now we're going to be looking a little more at Yitzhak and realize that he, too, didn't just live a perfect life, but he has his ups and his downs, and I'm thankful for that because I don't think there's any one of us who doesn't have the ups and downs in this life, but I encourage us we shouldn't have the downs. We shouldn't, you know, we need to trust in our Lord and walk and walk by faith. Um, I just will remind you at the end, again, though, Jacob's actions were not out of greed. And he was not blackmailing Esau. I've heard both. Neither of that's what was going on. Esau wasn't at his mercy. But what we do see in Jacob at that point was a lack of faith, of trusting God and letting God work it out. That's where, you know, he, he wanted to help God. I think we fall into that category and why I'm saying it. We, God doesn't need any one of us to help him along. <laughs> and we all know that, but I just want to encourage us in our trials also to recognize them. And that's fitting because as we go into chapter 26 now in verse 1, we're going to see that Yitzhak is coming into a time of testing and this chapter is testings and refinings for Isaac. Now, why would God allow him, this one who obviously loved the Lord with all his heart, who was willing to uh, go along with his dad in the near sacrifice, why would this one need to be refined? Didn't he have it all together? Wasn't he the perfect example? Well, in his perfect example, we see that in our humanity, it's not... Uh, it's not, you can't rest on past laurels. You can't say, because I did this right, I'm going to live perfectly all the rest of the time. I wish we could do that, but it, we are works in progress, and that's the whole point, is as we go through tests, to trust the Lord in them and allow Him to work them out, so your test becomes your testimony, your mess becomes your message. You see the hand of the Lord work, and He, the Lord says to us, in Kepha's book, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Anyone fit that category? <laughs> Have you had times when you've been distressed by various trials? Mm -hmm. Let me put it this way. Any of you not in that category? <laughs> Let's find out who you are. <laughs> okay? So... Peter's hitting it head on. He knows that, that those he's, his, his book is speaking to all the way to 2023. It says in verse 7, So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus Christ. So what are our trials for? So that our faith, which is more precious than gold, can come out shining for the Lord, that we can give him that praise, that glory, that honor, that we can lift up his name. As I was just mentioning the, the uh, story of the one who the Lord miraculously brought through um, from a car accident off into a ravine, days in the ravine, dealing with weather, broken body, 
even had a close call with a bear and he was spared and he gave all glory to God. It, whatever our trials and tribulations are, we should be in the midst of them praising our God, thanking him for taking time to mold us and make us, you know, to get that dross out of the gold. Where does the gold have to go? Into the fire into the kiln. It's not that it gets taken off in a nice, easy way. It's, it's in our trials that we have the dross removed from us. So keep that in mind, especially if you're in a trial right now. Don't be discouraged. Realize your God is at work in all your circumstances. I have no idea. There we go. My Bible went all the way to Kings instead of bare sheet Genesis. But God is at work. Don't get discouraged in the middle of it. God is at work. And he will bring you through. He will bring you to victory. That's what he's promised. You just have to stay in line with him in your faith walking it and you'll see it. So we read in verse 1 that there was a famine in the land. Now, famine often is a sign of either a test or a punishment. There are times when famine was brought on as a judgment, but many a time we see that it was a test that's going on. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Let me finish reading here. The famine in the land, besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. Okay, now, the days of Abraham, when he dealt with the famine in the land, were a over a hundred years ago or about a hundred years ago so there's a long time in between that Yitzhak was well aware of the famine in his father's life and what his father did about it even though it was before he was born but you don't think Abraham taught him told him walked him through that I'm sure he did so we're going to see that even though Isaac had that head knowledge <laughs> When the rubber hit the road and the famine hit the land, he did the same thing that his father did. He did the same thing that Daddy Abraham did. He's going to go to man rather than to God when this hard time came along. Um, it could be that he remembered Avimelech, Abimelech was the one who helped his father Abraham. This is back in chapter 20, by the way. Um, 20 and verse 15 is where Abimelech blesses Abraham in spite of what Abraham had almost caused to come onto his home and we'll talk about that as we go through it with Isaac but it's very interesting how similar these two walk through the same circumstances but it could be because Abimelech did bless his dad but he thought that he would go in the same way it would happen for him would be a blessing <clears throat> So, the days of Abraham, um, when he first came into the land in chapter 12 and verse 10. Well, let's look at that real quick since that's Genesis. It's easy to get back to. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 10. Um, in, in 12, 2, and 3, God's promising to make Abraham a nation, to give him the land and uh, the, the progeny, the family leading to, leading to the Messiah also. Um, but then when we drop down to verse 10... It says, now there was famine in the land, so Avram went down to Egypt to live there for a time because the famine was severe in the land. So the land that we call Israel today, obviously there were two periods of time when there was uh, famine in the land. Uh, the sad thing is Yitzhak should have looked at the whole story and he should have turned to his God. That he's going to go down to Gerar. That's what we're told in this verse. So Isaac went to Gerar. Now Gerar is about 11 miles south of Gaza. Uh, it's about three days journey south of Jerusalem. You're headed down toward Egypt. And in this time, Gerar's territory, because it was wider, is going to be very close to the border with Egypt. Roger, if you can call up that map for us, then they can see where Gerar is. Well, he's calling that up, um, let me explain to you, Isaac's going to also go to Abimelech. But because there's a hundred years in between, it's very likely it is not the same man. It's probably that man's uh, son or grandson even. We're going to see that that name really is more of a, a, a dynasty name, like you had the pharaohs. Um, the dynastic name of the rulers in the area that eventually will be called Philistia because of the Philistines, um, but that comes, you know, a bit later. Anyway, it, it's very much like the name Pharaoh. It's, you know, a, a 
a title. Okay, I'll show you that. There's that's not the map. The there we go. That's the map I called up. I didn't get a chance to look at the other maps that you had. But found. the second one I had was this one. Okay, which see. well maybe easier to see, but there was so much else I didn't want to confuse. That's why I went with the simpler. If you look on the right side, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron, Hebron is how I say it. You've heard a lot about Beersheba, Beersheba, Abraham. There's Roger circling it. There's there and Gerard starts above, but it's also going to go down. But you can see on the left, Gaza. You can see the plane called Philistia in time. That's the area we're in. If we keep going down through the Negev at the bottom of the map, you keep going down, you'll come to Egypt. And remember, Gerar was more than just a city. It was a territory. We're going to see that there's a valley of Gerar. We're going to see the place called Gerar. We're going to see that when Isaac's moved away from the area, he comes to Beersheba. So just realize there's a little distance here. It's, it's there close. But it's not, you know, one and the same, just a pinpoint on the map. Okay, if you think your other map is better, go ahead and bring it up now. Um, I don't mind. There you go. If that helps you also, um, Gerard, there you can see the Dead Sea. That might help you also. Um, and again, if you come down, I don't know. There you go. You can see the brook called Egypt. So see, you're in the Egypt by that area. Kiddush Barnea is where they go into, you know, one of the last stops before they go into the Promised Land. Um, it's actually where the spies went out and <coughs> came back with a bad report, but still. Um, anyway, I think I've covered it enough. I hope I've not said anything I should have said. Um, so back to our, where we are here. He's going down to Gerar. He's on his way down to Egypt. He's going to Abimelech, who's known in here as the king of the Philistines, because by the time this is being written for us, we have Moshe being able to tell us fully you know, what has developed in that area. Um, let me show you how we know that Abimelech is a, a title name. Go with me to 1 Samuel, 1 Shmuel, chapter 21, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 15. 1 Samuel 21, verses 10 to 15. We have to get the little bit of the story here so that when I show you something else, you know we're talking about the same time. So, in 1 Samuel 21, verse 10, we have, Then David, David arose, fled that day from Shaol, from Saul, and went to Achish, or Achish, king of Gat, or of Gath depending on whether you're saying it in the Hebrew or the English. But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Shaol has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? David took these words to heart, greatly feared Achish, king of God. So he disguised his sanity before them, acted insanely in their hands, scribbled on the doors of the gate, let, gate sorry, let his saliva run down into his beard, and then Achash said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman? Why did you bring him to me? What David did is he acted like he was insane. <clears throat> he was no threat to this one called Achish, this, this um, king of the land, Achish king of Gat, of Gath. He's the, an insane person's no threat. So David hid the fact he was a mighty warrior in the Lord by acting insane. Okay, and you see how the one that, that he was brought to was Achish, king of Gat. Okay, now keep all that in mind and go with me to Psalm 34, to Halim 34. And when we look at this psalm, whoops, I got to get to it. Okay, when we look at it, we see before we even start with the first verse, a little, um, it's not the title of the psalm, but a little understanding for it. It says, a psalm of David, of David. So we know this is one of the ones that David wrote. He wrote most of them, but not all of them. It says, a psalm of David when he feigned madness before Avimelech, who drove him away and he departed. Okay? Now, here he's called Avimelech or Abimelech. It's the same time when he feigned madness before Achish. The king of God. Okay, it's the, that's the same thing. So he's called Akish in First Samuel. He's called Abimelech or Abimelech 
in song. So you see how it's a title. It would be like Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, had another name. We just know him as Pharaoh. Well, this one, this Avimelech that David was before, his other name was Achish or Akish. Okay, so that shows us the, the name, how, how we know that it's a title. Um, I'm looking and trying to make sure that I've told you everything. As we talked last week also, and I think it got onto the recording, I don't think it was just the after discussion, of how there was not a land called Palestine, how it was the name put on the land of Israel as a slur at Israel when the Romans were in control. They took the name off of the ancient enemy of Israel, the Philistines, Philistia and Palestina. It just warped into um, being, being uh, pronounced Palestine. Uh, but again, I went looking for more research for you and it says that as I had said last week, the Palestinians really are uh, those who have come from the Arab nations around, the local Arab nations, that that's where their roots are. That even the Philistines were a non-Semitic people that settled in the southern coastal area of Canaan, and in the Hebrew, the, it was Peleshet, and they became called Peleset. That was the Greek or, origin, and from Peleset, it also comes down to, by the time the Romans are in control, Palestine. You can hear the name, you know, how the familiarity of the name went. But it's making it very clear that Israel didn't steal a land called Palestine and make it their own. They entered into the land called Canaan, Canaan. God said, I will thrust out the nations that are in there and give you this land, put my name on it, it will be yours forever. So it was not the Palestinian people saying, this is Palestine, this was our home, and Israel is the occupier. No, no, There's, that's a false history, that is a lie. And any who want to declare themselves Palestinian, would, the best they could say is that they're, they're trying to claim to be Philistines, and those people known as the Philistines died out. Um, other Arab nations, I'm sure, are what they morphed into, the same as Esau. There's, there's uh, ten nations that come from him. They make up the Arab nations today, but that's who they are. That's who their origin is. Um, so the, the lie that they try to speak of Palestine being the land and Israel took it is not, there's no truth in that at all. Back on track. We're back before uh, Avi Melech. Akish now we know was his name, his title, Avimelech. And let me um, give you just real quick, just saying it, not you looking it up and reading it all. But in chapter 18 and verse 14, Sarah is to have a son. She's to have Yitzhak in a year, okay? That's in chapter 18, the, the angel of the Lord appeared to Avraham and said, next year I'll visit Sarah at the season and she'll have her son. In chapter 20, we have Avraham at Gerar, okay? Chapter 20, verse 1, this is before Isaac's born. That's when Avraham and Sarah went down to Gerar. In chapter 21, Yitzhak, Isaac, is born. In chapter 25, in verse 26, which was just last week, I think, for us, Isaac is 60 years old when his sons were born. Okay, which means that 61 years after Abraham was down in Gerar, because Abraham went down in Ger to Gerar before Sarah had Isaac, just before. So, um, gives you that timing. Then in chapter 26, where we are today, and you can go back to that, if we look down at verse 34, we're going to see that Esau is 40 years old in verse 34. Now, that's sometime after Isaac's gone to Gerar, He's gone back to Beersheba. I showed you that on the map. We'll get to that hopefully today. So the Gerar events um, that we're reading about, the twins were probably grown up. They didn't go down with Isaac and uh, his wife, Rebecca. Another reason why we think they're probably grown up, because if they were young, they would have been going with them. So that means that Isaac went down to Gerar at least 80 years, if not closer to 100 years, after Abraham did in chapter 20. So that's how I get to that dating, just not to confuse you. But we've got to realize here in verse 2 now, 
we've got Isaac at about at least 80 years old and his twins are considered grown. Um, I realize everyone lived much longer back then. Isaac's going to live to 180, so he's got a long ways to go. But the kids aren't infants or toddlers either. So when we read in verse 2, And the Lord appeared to him, appeared to Isaac, and said, and I'll stop you right there before we look at what was said, this is the first time since Mount Moriah, uh, Mount Moriah, since Abraham was... <coughs> Okay, sweetie. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, folks. We had a delivery. <laughs> okay. So, um, and I guess I jumped onto the mountain top. I can't get down here myself. Um, oh, okay. So, Mount Moriah, when Abraham was willing to offer up Yitzhak, that would be probably, I'm going to say, at least 50 years ago by this point. Okay, time has passed. Remember, Isaac was somewhere around 30 years of age. And now we have him at 80 years of age. So we've got about a 50-year spread in between this time. We're moving faster than y'all think we are. <laughs> okay? So what did the angel Lord say when, when he appeared? And this had to have been an unusual because we're not reading that the Lord appeared and the Lord appeared and the Lord appeared. So this is major. I think it's major because Isaac's on a major oops and God's going to jump in there. Is this the first time that the Lord speaks to him? Since then. It's the first recorded time. I cannot tell you that the Lord didn't speak to him in between. I'm sure that there must have been, you know, fellowship between the Lord and he, but we're not made aware of it, and it would definitely be the first time, I believe, where he appears to him, you know, where it's not just, you know, how we know we hear the Lord in prayer. But this is where there was an appearance made. That to me is a stronger, is that the right word to use? You know, it's it's more of a, whoa, you know, mm -hmm. the Lord's appearing here, you know, um, type of situation. But again, that's out of, out of ignorance. When we get home and you talk to Isaac, you might find out the Lord appeared, you know, other times too. But this is all that God felt we needed to know in his life. So he's been at one mountain peak experience with the angel of the Lord, or his dad was anyway. And, and Well, he was too, because the voice comes out of heaven and stops Abraham from slaying him. I mean, how could he miss out on that? And now this is the first time we're reading of the angel Lord appearing to Isaac. And he says to him, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. That's why we know Isaac was on his way down to Egypt. He's going to go through Gerar, but he's going to go on down to Egypt. Probably because there was plenty of food and pasturage down in Egypt, and Isaac thought this would be a good move. Just like Avram thought it would be a good move when he went down to the land in, in, of Egypt in chapter 12. Now, in all fairness to Isaac, we don't read that Isaac had ever been told to remain in the land. Okay, not, not up to this point. Now we're going to be told that. Isaac is, is being told by the angel of the Lord, this is your condition for blessing. See, the land was promised to Abraham and his descendants. It wasn't that, that God had inter, yeah, the wrong word I want, had interacted in, the, in Isaac's life until this moment where he says, and I don't think I read it to you yet, I didn't. Look at verse 3 with me. Not only is he not to go down to Egypt, he's to stay in the land, which I shall tell you, live for a time in the land. I will be with you and bless you, for to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abram. There's a whole lot in this. What God is saying, what the angel of the Lord is saying in his appearance to Isaac is, if you want the blessing, if you want to be blessed, the condition for you is stay in the land. Boom. Period. And in all fairness of seeing Isaac's ups and downs right now, we're going to see some, some pretty big mistakes. Isaac never does leave the land of Canaan. He stays in the land. He is in Gerar. He's going to go a little ways from Gerar, but he never goes down into Egypt. 
he stayed in the land that God wanted him to stay in. And for us, as a picture of seeing that the son of promise was to always live in the land of promise. And the Lord met all his needs in that land because he said in verse, th in verse 3, what we just read here, that he would uh, establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. Establish means perform it. I will fulfill it. I will act it out. And what oath did he give to Abraham? Well, let's look back and see it real quickly. It's in chapter 22 of, of Bereshit, of course, because it's to Abraham. Genesis 22, and we'll look at verses 15 and 16. There we go. Okay. Bereshit 22, 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abram a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you've done this thing, not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. That's huge huge that's huge in fact let me go on and read verse 18 and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice so the lord swore by himself why did the lord swear by himself there's right there's no one greater and everyone is less than so he had to swear by himself he you know he basically puts the right hand up and instead of the left hand on the bible he could put it on his heart i don't know how else to describe it but the Lord, in all his greatness, is swearing by himself, like, I'm doubly telling you, I'm doubly promising you, you've not withheld, I'm not going to withheld, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless your children, even their enemies will be sub submissive under them. So it's a huge promise that God made to Abraham. And now, when we go back into chapter 26, we see that God is establishing that with Isaac. The promise, in essence, is now being passed down through him. I went too far. In verse 3, establish the oath I swore to your father Abraham, Abraham, that I will fulfill that oath. And we see that in what he says in verse 4. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Does that sound very familiar? Does that sound a lot like what I read in chapter 22? It should, because it's not word for word an identical quote, but it's saying the same thing. The same blessings were to come on him. It's a land, it's a nation, and it's blessing. And it, it was given to Abraham, now it's been given to Yitzhak. And for Yitzhak, the only condition we see is remain in the land. Don't go out of the land of promise. Uh, multiply means he's going to increase and what's he going to increase it says all these lands you may have all these countries it would be referring to the lands that the the nations whatever you want to call them that were in what we call the holy land today in that area in Canaan so remember there were all kinds of Canaanite tribes I'm going to list 10 of them for you I believe in chapter 15 we're going to go, whoops, I don't want to do that one. I'll go to that. Okay, here we go. Go to Genesis 15 with me. 15. 15. Yeah, go to Genesis 15 because we want to see who's in this land that God's saying, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to multiply it for you. In chapter 15, verses 18 to 21, this comes right after God cut covenant with Abraham. Remember the cutting of the covenant? Remember, his name's changed because God's entered in a covenant with him. It's after Abraham has split the animals and he's tried to keep all the, the crows and ravens and all that away from the animals. He falls into a deep sleep and the angel Lord passes through that path by himself. Remember, we saw that's the way they made covenants back then. The two who were in agreement would be walking through it together. What God was saying is, it's on me. It's not on you, Abraham. It's on me. It's unconditional. I will keep it. And here's what God promised him in that time after he had passed through. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I've given this land. From the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. That's a whole lot bigger than just the land that we call Israel today. The river of Egypt, I believe, is the Nile. Even if it is the Wadi that some want to call it, it's still a river in Egypt. 
when we look at the Euphrates, that's Iraq. That's a big distance. But then he goes and he names all those that were in that area. This is the area, the land that God says, I'm giving to you, Abraham. This is what God's saying I'm going to give to Yitzhak. There at that time were the Kenite, the Canazite, the Kadmonite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Raphaim, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. I said it all in English for you rather than tripping up with the Hebrew words. <laughs> Where did they, these are all little towns? Or? These are peoples yeah. that were living in the land. Well, how do they name these people? I mean, how do they know? Because God told us that's who was there. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's a lot of names, and I'm sure if you could get into the ancient uh, Mesopotamian records, uh, maybe not even Mesopotamia because they came from Mesopotamia, but there are ancient records, clay tablets, Aramaic, Hebrew, etc., that that historically give evidence that always backs up the scripture. But I don't know whether this is the most complete here in the scripture or not. But if God says that's who was in the land and we know that there were peoples in the land, even when they finally get to the land through Joshua and they are having to conquer the land, that's who they're, they're casting out is some of these that are named here because there's seven nations in the land when Joshua goes in that God said, I'll cast them all out before you. You just have to be obedient to me and receive the blessings. So... Um, God told us in Abraham's day, even though these descendants were living in this land, it's going to be yours, and it's going to belong to your son, and it's going to belong to his son, and so forth and so on. So here's where we get the, some of the borders, the parameters of the area that will be Israel's. Um, it's never been hers entirely because she's never been entirely obedient where God could bless her with it. But that day is coming. And that's when Messiah will sit on the throne and she will have the entire land that is to be hers at that time. Back to chapter 26. So um, he will give um, Isaac's descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, by those who come from you, Isaac, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So it wasn't just you all are going to get it and everybody else suffers. They would be blessed through them. We know the greatest blessing is through the one who comes from that line is Messiah. And through the Messiah, through the Savior, the whole world is blessed when they come into salvation with the Lord. So we know it, it, we can narrow it right down to the Messiah himself, but we can also see in it, and I'll give you just the example in the bearer outline. Even today, Israel is a startup nation that has been on the front lines medically, agriculturally, in many different ways, coming up with new things that are so advantageous for the health of the people today. This is God's blessing to the people through the Jewish people. So even in that, we can see a foreshadowing of the greater that will come. But now we know it's been promised to Yitzhak and to his descendants, the same as it was promised to Avraham. And it's important to lay that down and know that. We're going to see it was promised to Avraham, to Yitzhak, and finally to Yaakov, to Jacob, the forefathers of the nation of Israel. And why that's important to, today is for those naysayers who say the land is not Israel's, doesn't belong to her, she should be cast out, the others should be brought in. No. In fact, God confirmed this covenant to Isaac here. He had given it to Abraham five times. I'll just list them for you. You can read them on your own. And if you have your cross-references, this is all down in it. You don't need to hurry and scurry writing. But you can read God giving it to Abraham in chapter, this is all in Genesis, in chapter 12, verse 1, and verses 3 through 7. Then it was repeated again chapter 13 verses 14 to 18 it was repeated in chapter 15 it was repeated again in chapter 17 verses 1 through 8 and 15 to 22 and we have the last time that we read in chapter 22 verses 15 to 18 five times God said to Abraham this is the land I'm giving you and your descendants 
Two times he gives it to Isaac, right here in the first five verses, and then when we get down to verse 24 in this chapter, you will see God reaffirming it. I'll put it that way. Two times he's going to give it to Jacob in chapter 28, and because that's our future, let's look at that real quickly. Genesis chapter 28, we definitely won't get there for a little bit. Uh, we're going to look at verses 13 to 15. And we read there, God speaking to Yaakov, to Jacob. And behold, the Lord was standing above it. This is the ladder, the dream that, that um, Jacob saw. Uh, the Lord was standing above it and said, I'm the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac, your, your father and your grandfather. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Hear how it's being passed down? God promised it to Abraham, then God promised it to Isaac, now God's promising it to Jacob. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, the east, the north, and the south, and in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Do you hear the same thing? That's chapter 28, verses 13 to 15. Do you hear the same language, the same thoughts there? Verse 15, Behold, I'm with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done all that I have promised you. Jacob was going out. He was going back to, to family, back to Padan Aram. He's going to meet his wife there. It's going to be many years later. I'll tell you because you probably won't remember unless you already know. 20 years later, he's going to return to the land. Why? Because God told him. I'm taking you out. I will bring you back. I will fulfill everything I have promised you. So God gave it to Abraham. God gave it to Isaac. God gave it to Jacob. And then the, the last time we read of it also is chapter 35 of Genesis. Chapter 35. And we'll read it in verses 11 and 12. The land which I gave to Abraham and Yitzhak, I will give to you, Jacob. I will give the land to your descendants after you. Um, I think I forgot to read verse 11. I'm sorry. I read what God's giving, but let me read to you who's giving it. In verse 11, God also said to Jacob, to Yaakov, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a multitude of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from you. And the land that I promised, which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, to your descendants after you. So the El Shaddai, the Almighty God. If you have a problem with Israel belonging to that land, that's who you need to take it up with. It is Almighty God. Go argue with him. He said it nine different times. Five to Abraham, two to Isaac, two to Jacob. I think God means what he's saying. And I think that it's the land that belongs to their descendants. I think that it's the land, I don't think I know. It's the land that Messiah is going to return to and sit on an earthly throne. When we see the fulfillment of thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're talking about from this land. So anyone who wants to call it Palestine today, who wants to say we're a people and it's our land and Israel's is occupiers, well, you're arguing against the history that God has given us in all these chapters in Genesis. You're arguing against the facts. You're arguing against Almighty God and I can end it right there because we all know who wins and who loses when you're arguing against God. He keeps his word. He is faithful. All Isaac has to do to stay blessed is stay in the land. And the promise given always refers to a land, to a nation, and a blessing. We see it every single time. So read the scriptures on your own. I'm choosing not to take the time because by the time I would read all of those today, we would be at the end of class. <laughs> and since we've gone through the majority and I brought you to the ones we have not yet, I felt that that would uh, be proof enough so that you would say, yes, Rochelle is telling us what the scripture is saying. So, we'll move on from verse 4. It's, it's, God's told him, verse 5 says, Because Abraham obeyed me. Okay, let me back up and read 4 just quickly. I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, give your descendants all this land, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and fulfilled his duty to me, kept my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Okay, because Abraham obeyed. 
That's powerful. The Hebrew denotes a constant obedience. It wasn't just that he obeyed once, one time. That he continually was obedient to God. That all God revealed to all God instructed. When God made covenant with Abraham, he, he entered into that with God. Even though God made it, it was dependent on God. Still, Abraham had it appropriated to him by his obedience. That's how he received the blessing. Now God's under oath to Abraham. He has to perform what he said. He has to pass it down to Isaac. It's not, and, and I'm saying this tongue in cheek, God doesn't have a choice, okay? Now, you know why I'm saying it that way, because God is supreme and God is sovereign and God, you know, no one can say to God, you can't do that, and I'm not doing that. But God bound himself, swore by himself to this oath. And this is what he said. So now he is passing it down to Abraham's son because that's what God promised Abraham he would do. So nothing is said of Yitzhak having to be obedient to receive it. It was promised to him. But if he wants to be blessed, he's got to be obedient and he's got to obey. He's got to stay. And to his credit, he does stay. Rhonda has a question. Can you help unmute her, Roger? Do what? Unmute Roger. R Rhonda, she has a oh, question. Rhonda. Sorry. Okay. okay, Rhonda, try to unmute yourself also. There we go. Okay, so it's saying that um, because Abraham obeyed my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, this is before Moses, right? Yes, so my next is, point. The commandments and the laws and words and the statutes, what are those? Very good question, and it was my next point. So you're right on, right on target. Because this is before law, what we're seeing here is obedience to, thus says the Lord, to God's word, to God's laws that supersede, that weren't just a period of time. Like we talked about recently, when we say that, that we're not under law, we're under grace, that's true. By grace we receive the gift of salvation. But does that mean that now we can go murder, we can, we can you know, covet, we can commit adultery, we can steal, we can lie? Of course not. That never goes out of, of um, time with God. So in the same way, God gave Abraham rules and laws and statutes and so forth to be obedient to. It was the word of the Lord. And in that same way, we are bound to the word of the Lord. We need to be just as obedient today in our walk with the Lord as Avram had to be. Isaac had to be to receive blessing. Jacob will have to be to receive blessing. If you want, remember, we, if you're with me on Shabbat, we had Mount Gerizim and we had Mount Eval. All the blessings and all the cursings. If you want to be under the cursings, just be disobedient. It's that simple. You want to receive the blessings, be obedient. So in that same way, the, the charges, the commandments, the statutes, the laws, before the Mosaic Law was given, were still, um, Moshe probably used those words when he wrote this because they had laws and statutes and ordinances and commandments by that point. So he used the familiar language, but it was simply obey God's laws, obey God's words. The word of God is law and is supreme. And they always had to be in obedience to that to receive the blessing. So does that clear it up? So you're saying we won't see anything in writing what those things are specifically, but because God and Abraham had such a close relationship, Abraham knew what right and wrong was, and it could be categorized into those various categories. Right, right, yeah. yes. Yes. Out to us. Right, right. The same way we don't know, you know, Adam and Eve, they walked and talked with God in the cool of the evening. You know, there's much more than what we get. We get the bare outline. But yes, God had a walking, talking relationship with Abraham. And he would tell Abraham, you should do this, you should not do that. You should do this, you should not do that. Eventually, when we get down what God is saying we get it down in what's called the law and we get it called commandments we get it called statutes we get it called ordinances 
but it, it just, that's the words it morphed into. But it's always obedience to the Word of God. Uh, and as God revealed it to them, you know, like, like we said, Genesis 15, when God showed Abraham his plan in the stars, we don't know what was said word for word. We know what we've learned from our dealing with scriptures, that the heavens declare the glory of God. Hebrews tells us the glory of God is Yeshua. So when Abraham saw the glory of God in the heavens declaring, narrating, telling the story of Yeshua, that's what became faith to him. That's what saved him. It couldn't save him to just say, oh, you're going to have lots of kids. But see, we have to use our other scriptures to help us understand that. In that same way, we don't know what God said specifically, but I'm sure he was telling Abraham, you're not to lie. You're not to covet what someone else has. We see that in how he even tried to raise Lot. And when Lot was not living the life he should, he suffered consequences because of it. So in that same way, it was not an excuse like, oh, well, there isn't law yet. You know, San Bernardino hasn't put down speed limit 35 yet, so I can go 40, 50, 60. God says, you know, don't do what's not safe on that road. There you go. You know, so, but it, it becomes what we are familiar with calling statutes and commandments. And so Moses uses those words that they were to be obedient to God's commandments, his statutes, and his laws. But I'll just boil it down to be obedient to thus saith the Lord. This is God's word. So, and in that same way, you may have God speak to you and tell you something you're to be obedient to. And it may not be the law of the land, and it may not be what, you know, a law anywhere. But to you, it becomes a law. You're to be obedient to that commandment. So again, even though we're not living in and under the law, the law is to show them that they could not save themselves. That everything they do, they fall short of that pure, holy standard. But the law never saved. That's why Moshe couldn't even take them into the promised land because then it would be the picture of law taking them into the promised land. But the one who brings them into the promised land is Yahshua, whose name is a form of Yahushua, God saves. And that's what brought them into the land of promise, the salvation of God. So, okay, do we get it now? Okay, all good? Any other questions, comments? Okay, do we need more air movement? No. That's good. Okay. All right. Then, he's been told he's to be obedient, so he does follow. Verse 6 tells us, so Yitzhak lived in Gerar. He stopped there. He didn't go back up where he came from, but he stayed in Gerar. Now, Gerar probably was a wealthy city on the caravan route to Egypt. Um, Gerar means lodging place, so it could have been a, a place that a lot stopped and lodged on their way. You know, got a little food and a little good rest and then got back on their camel caravans. Um, and again, this whole area is called the border between Egypt and Canaan, um, when eventually later is misnamed Palestine, but we saw it on the map, so I think you're clear on that. So Yitzhak is obedient to God, but I'm going to put it this way. He was obedient by the skin of his teeth. <laughs> He's right on the edge. And if you want to know why I say it that way, look with me in Job chapter 19 and verse 20. Job 19 and verse 20. Job 19 and verse 20, where we read, My bone clings to my skin and my flesh, and I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. So, did you know that proverb or that, whatever you want to call it, is right out of the scripture. Job, Job lived uh, close to Abraham's time, maybe even a little ahead of Abraham. So, we've got that expression, as old as time. But we get the idea he was right on the edge of what would become Egypt. So, um, he enjoys the blessings here. But he's not going to enjoy the presence of the Lord here. He's going to get into trouble in Gerar. Okay? That's an application to us. Are we lost? Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, do I need to repeat something? No. No, okay. Just, just want to make sure that everybody's okay. I don't want to leave anybody. What I'm saying is 
for a believer who wants to live just on the edge of their faith. They've got a, a foot wanting to be in the world, but they're, they're just trying to stay just inside of where they have to be. That's not really the best place to be either, because even though Isaac stayed in the land, he wasn't in the fellowship and the presence of the Lord like he should have been, so he gets himself into trouble. And usually a believer who is that close to the edge with the world is not experiencing God's presence and usually gets into spiritual trouble. It's usually a step down and into trouble. So let's see what happened to Isaac and see if we can learn a lesson from him. Verse 7, when the men of the place, the men of Gerar, asked about his wife, he said, She's my sister. <laughs> For he was afraid to say, My wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebecca since she is beautiful. Hmm. How familiar is the story? <laughs> Can we not just change a couple names here and have Abraham saying, She's my sister? I was afraid they might kill me on account of Sarah because she's so beautiful. <laughs> we have the exact same story. Was we that, have, wasn't that his cousin, though? Rebecca is related. Sarah was also related to yeah. Abraham, but it was a half truth. It wasn't just, and in fact, she was only a half sister. She was only a half sister for Abraham and for Isaac. It's not his sisters; it's cousin, yes. like you cousin. said. Cousin was removed, if I remember right, but cousin <laughs> anyway. So it's it's just it's it's an oops. Okay, no easy way to put it. It's an oops, um, and often. And I'll say it for any parents who are out there, children often imitate their parents. They imitate them good ways, they imitate them bad ways, okay? We need to be careful if you are a parent in someone's life, if you're a spiritual parent in someone's life even, you just need to be careful because kids watch the walk. They yeah. hear the talk yeah. second, they watch the walk. You know, so I'm not going to say that Abraham didn't live a great godly life, he did. That he made a mistake and Isaac made the same mistake. However, I'm going to give it a little, I'm going to redeem him a little bit here. Okay? We have like father, like son. We're saying for Abraham and Isaac. Well, in chapter 22, when Abraham is a picture of the father and Isaac is a picture of the son. And the son was willing to lay down his life along with the father. And then I hear uh, Yeshua's own words in Yochanan in John chapter 14 and verse 9 say, If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. So in the same way, Isaac also, we can see the spiritual, that he followed in his father's spiritual steps. It's not that he always followed the bad example. You know, I, I want to redeem that a little bit. But we do see Isaac's going to go from a spiritual high to a blatant sin, a weakness in the flesh. He was scared in his flesh. They'll kill me because my wife is so beautiful and they'll want her. And we see, you know, other times too, Peter was afraid to step up and, and, and admit that he knew the Lord. And yet we see the Lord redeem him also. And I will read to you 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Because I think it's apropos for us when we're talking about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. And there we read, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Mm -hmm. So for any of us and all of us, don't get so confident in yourself. Oh, I would never do that. <laughs> How many times are those famous last words, what you thought you'd never do, you find yourself doing? Mm -hmm. So just, you know, it behooves us. Just learn, learn the lesson here. Let Isaac experience it and let us learn from him. And where it says that, that uh, Rebecca, Rivka, was beautiful, our Hebrew gives us the idea that she had a very beautiful face. So she must have been a lot like her mama in Lep, her in Sarah. She was beautiful. Um, so he, he had reason, but he needed to trust God and not fear. And, and God would have, of course, kept them safe. So verse 8, now it came about because he's told the people around there that's his sister, not his wife. So when it came about, when he had been there a long time. Now, notice that he'd been there a long time. This didn't just happen in one night. 
Um, and really, I think because of what happened prior with Avraham, Avimelech, the, the, the king, the, the ruler, I'll call him the ruler, in Avraham's day, it, let me just remind you, he had brought Sarah into his harem, but he hadn't touched her. And time had passed there also, and then God awakened him in a dream, if you don't remember the story in chapter yeah. 20. And God <laughs> basically said, you're a dead man. You know, you've taken another man's wife. If you don't give her back, you know, and ask Avraham to pray for you and bless you, you'll die. You know, and Abimelech, the heathen king, takes our man of God to task. You know, he's the one that calls him up short. Hey, what did you do to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Because I could have laid with her or someone else could have been like vault. What would have come from that? So Alvi Melek was a little heated about it, but then he says, you know, go out for me, but live wherever you want, anywhere you want in my land, I'll bless you. Pray for me. He did exactly what God had told him to do. Well, he probably passed that down to his son or his grandson, the same way Abraham passed the story down to Isaac, and even, I think, down to Jacob, because Jacob was 15 before his grandfather passes away. So I think a lot of the lessons were passed down. The same way we talk to our children and our grandchildren today, we want them to learn from our mistakes so that they don't have to make those mistakes. And how many parents, they need to really line up their lives and look in the mirror we need to really guide our children and not let them scatter out. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he won't depart. It doesn't say you won't have wandering years, but God's hand is there. Yes, yes, we need to be. It behooves us to be. So we've got the same issue, the same problem coming down the pike, but I think this Avi Malik also had a head start because we read, you know, now it came back, it's been there a long time, Avi Malik, king of the Philistines, looked down through a window, and he saw them. Behold, Yitzhak was caressing his wife, Rivka. He wasn't acting like she's his sister. She was act he was acting like she's his wife. <laughs> so, you know, this, by the way, is another reason why we're sure the twins weren't around, because if they had been calling them Ima and Abba, mom and dad, you know, then, then people would have known. But Avi Malaketch sees what's going on and said, realizes, hey, <laughs> That's not your sister. That's your but, wife. But this happened at the same place? The same area. Gerard. Yes. The it's same different. location. Can you imagine yeah. poor king? He was scared of his wits. He knew that he was a powerful <laughs> God. And that's why I think he passed that down to his kids. You know, <laughs> there's this God out there that, you know, spoke to me, kept me, you know, and, and Avi Melech was blessed because he was obedient. So he, he could have been telling his son, when you're in power, you know, keep this in mind. You know, if these other people that are out there, if they come, you want to be kind toward them. You know, that their God is a great God. I have no idea what he said, but it apparently was passed down, I think, because this Abimelech was pretty smart, pretty quick, too. So verse 9, you know, he's seen, in verse 8, he's seen the caressing. Verse 9, Abimelech called Yitzhak and said, Behold! She certainly is your wife. So how is it that you said she's my sister? What are you doing, Isaac? Why did you say that? And Isaac tried to defend himself. He says, because I thought otherwise I might be killed on account of her. And Avimelech said, what is this that you've done to us? One of the people might easily have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. Mm -hmm. He knew enough to know that would have been wrong and we would have been judged guilty. The only way I think he could have known that is from the, the um, heritage that he had passed down to him because, the, remember, this is 80 to 100 years later. So, Avi Melek, 80 to 100 years later. Remember, the famine is about 100 years apart, and Isaac's 80 now, and it was before Isaac was born. So it was at least 80 years, at least. And probably a little closer to the 100 because of the time that we have uh, recorded of the famine. So, long time, long time, and that's why it would have been a son, at least possibly a grandson, now being called Avi Melek, uh, because of passing down from age. So, um, he realizes, he calls him up short, and then he does something very wise in verse 11. 
So Abimelech commanded all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife will certainly be put to death. So he put the word out to his whole kingdom, I'll call it, and he told them all, You leave them alone, or you'll, I'll take your life from you. He probably again knew the consequences that they could have suffered in Abraham's day, and that they were spared because they were obedient to that God. And so he is also saying, we almost, we could have so easily, we could have done this, we would have been found guilty, you, you know, no one touched them. They are persona non grata, leave them alone. I like in the verse of 16, it said, uh, Amalek said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So That comes knew. later, that comes later. Oh, well, then we weren't there. But, yeah, but you're right, you're right, you know. They're, they're recognizing they had a regard for Abraham's progeny, his son. They had a regard for the God that they served, mm -hmm. um, being the one true and living God. They were afraid of judgment from the God of Abraham and Isaac, very clearly. 20, chapter 20, Abimelech was scared, and in this chapter we see the same thing. So... Yes, he, he tells everybody to leave them alone, but then he does the same thing his dad said too, which leads us to 16, because we read in verse 12, Now Isaac, Yitzhak, sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundred times as much. God blessed Isaac, even though he sinned, even though he, he compromised, or he, he put into compromise position. God didn't let anything happen. But remember, the, the promise was conditioned on Abraham's obedience. Isaac fell heir to that promise. Remember, all he had to do was stay in the land. But notice, it wasn't until Isaac repented of that sin, it's brought out and open, it's cleaned up, it's taken care of right, then God blessed him. Isaac wasn't being blessed until that point. And there is a difference between God's blessing and his presence. God was with Isaac. God protected Isaac. God was with Rivka, Rebecca. God protected Rebecca. But to receive the blessings, they had to be in right fellowship. God's faithful to his word for Abraham's sake. He followed his word to Isaac. And he blessed Isaac also because Isaac got back into right uh, where he could be blessed by God also. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13, we read there, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And what I want to bring out very clearly here is, even though Isaac put it into jeopardy, God is faithful. God did not allow anything to happen with the, the son of promise the, and the family of promise. God was going to keep his word faithfully to Abraham, protect that line and its continuation. That's who our God is. He is faithful even if we are not. But if we want the blessings, we need to be faithful to him. So going back to verse 12, we see that Isaac, after the confession, after things get righted the way it should be, the ship's back up right instead of upside down, we see that Isaac sowed and that it returned to him a hundred times as much. That's a hundredfold in the Old English, and a hundredfold return is very unusual, very unusual. Even in the most fruitful plains in Syria and the areas around there, the, the, the fertile areas of Syria, uh, the northern, if they get 80% of a return, it was considered wow. In the desert where Gerar is, usually the return is 25 to 50 percent. So that means if you plant four seeds, you could you could bank on um, uh, okay, you planted four, you could bank on one to two in the desert area, making it that the others would probably be scorched, you know, and they wouldn't they wouldn't survive. So for Isaac to have a hundredfold return, that means every seed he planted blossomed, grew, kept reproducing, that was the blessing of the Lord upon him. It's the, um, Isaac had only raised animals prior to this that we know about. Now he's got land. He might have rented the land from 
Abimelech, we don't know, but he apparently planted and raised crops. It's the first time that we hear about the sowing of the seed in the word of God. And it doesn't say seed, but it says he sowed in the land. What do you sow? You sow seed, okay? <laughs> so, and probably he was sowing seed for his flocks and his herds. He needed grass for them. They're in a desert area. What do you need in the desert? You need an oasis. You need uh, to, to have plenty of green grass for them to eat. So God was showing he was miraculously blessing and taking care of Isaac and the family. And because of that, the man, Isaac, verse 13, became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. Well, if you've got a hundredfold returning, <clears throat> you're becoming very wealthy very quickly, and that's what's going on. And it says in verse 14, he had possession of flocks and herds. He had a great household so that the Philistines, remember they're in that area, the Philistines now envied him. Uh-oh, here comes the problem, okay? <coughs> now, he's prosperous, his farming is prosperous, his cattle, his herds, his family. <coughs> Nobody could touch him physically, remember verse 11. So we've got a problem. The Philistines don't like him. He's getting all this, and, and we're not, you know, and, and there's a jealousy that's there. So now we've got a little problem, and it shows up in verse 15. Now all the wells which his father, Isaac's father's servants, had dug in the days of his father, Abraham, the Philistines stopped them up by filling them with dirt. Well, if you're in the desert area, what do you need to keep your grass green? Water. Water. <laughs> Can you count on a lot of rain from heaven if you're in the desert? No, Normally, no. <laughs> Normally, no. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go with that no. So obviously, and actually in the Hebrew, verse 15 says, and all the wells, which Avraham's servants had dug. All the wells were, were obstructed, were stopped up. What they were doing is, we're going to force Isaac out of our country. If you don't have water, you can't continue here. Because for the nomadic herdsmen, that, this water was not a luxury. Water was a necessity. So if every source of your water dries up, you're going to pick up your herds, your flocks, and everything, and you're going to move. And that's what they wanted. They wanted them to get out of here. Well, Some things never change. The, uh, they would stop the wells. No, it was... It was going to help them too, right? Because it was helping Isaac and Isaac's herds and Isaac's crops. It wasn't helping theirs. They had area around, but they didn't have what was Isaac's, and they weren't to touch Isaac's. So, okay, then we'll just make it, well, you know, it's like a, the, the water... No, I can't use that example because that doesn't fit. What can I say? I think you get the idea anyway that it, it, even if it hurt them some, it would totally hurt Isaac. And they were willing just because they didn't want him in such a state of blessing and taking what they thought ought to be theirs. Isn't that what they did to Abraham? Yes, yes. we got a very similar story. Very similar story. Pete and repeat. Repeat and repeat. <laughs> and that's why in verse 16, Abimelech said to Yitzhak, Go away from us. You're too powerful for us. They, were, they saw the strength of Isaac. They saw his blessing. He had the people. He had everything that he would need. And maybe Abimelech even was afraid the people would start following Isaac instead of following him. You know, he isn't providing for them. Maybe Isaac would provide for them. Who knows what Abimelech thought, but we know that that thought entered Pharaoh with the children of Israel in Egypt. Remember, first it was good for them in Egypt. They went down to Egypt. Jacob took the family down. There were only 70 in number. They were allowed to live in the land of Goshen. They started to flourish, and finally they grow to two and a half plus million people. And Pharaoh's saying, hmm, if an enemy comes in, and they side with our enemy and not with us, it will we'll die in our own land. We gotta get rid of those people, or, or in his case, first let's subjugate them, let's make them our slaves. So it's not a far cry to think that way for the leaders. Herod the Great, he's threatened by this king that was born, and he, let's kill off all the boy babies, all the male babies, two and under, so that he's sure he's got that king in the middle of that, 
to get rid of them. Caesars, we see, did that. So we see this, what, what we'll call today anti-Semitism, we see the roots of it right here. Against these people, they're flourishing, they're blessing, we don't like it, we want them out of here, get them out of here, and, and that's what you know, Abimelech did instead of coming against them. He just said, leave, go, go away from us, you're too powerful. Now, God spoke through Abimelech to Avraham. Remember how we said that in chapter 20? He talked to Abimelech in a dream, let him know what was going on, and Abimelech called up Abraham short, you know, and said, hey, you know, why didn't you tell me the truth? Well, when you're not communing with the Lord so that you're not hearing his voice, he may need to speak to you through someone else. He may send you someone who says, you know, you need to hear this from the Lord. Now, Avi Meli didn't say you need to hear it from the Lord, but remember where Isaac's living? He's living right on the edge of Egypt. He's living right on the edge of the world. What happened to Lot when Lot lived right on the edge? He got in trouble. He got in trouble. <laughs> Isaac and his people are going to just keep going down and heading for trouble. And so God awakens them through Avimelech again. And God did not want him to stay on the border. He was to live in the land of Canaan. He was to live in the land that God had promised, but not way down on the very edge. And, you know, one foot easily could slip into the world. Uh, and Egypt was a symbol to, of what I'm saying in this spiritual connotation of what the world is for us. So um, Yitzhak probably could have easily defeated them at that point. He was larger, he was stronger. But I think that he realized that would only cause an alienation between the people. It would only cause friction. It would only cause you know more trouble. It was not the right thing to do. So he did choose to leave. Okay, if God wants you somewhere else and you're not moving, God may send you a messenger. He may buffet you, your circumstances, and encourage your move, whether you want to realize that or not. Now, I'm not saying that literally. I just saw someone make a face who's living <laughs> through something, and I'm not saying for a moment that God is. You, know, you, you have all along been saying that you, the Lord has been leading you, and this is where you're to go. So it's a little different. I'm going to take you back to when Abraham was told, leave the land you know and go to where you don't know. I will go with you, and I have a, a place for you. I think you're in that category. Just, I have to say that, pardon me. I'm purposely not putting a name out on Zoom <laughs> so that there's no embarrassment there later. But uh, I don't think you're in, in standing in line of correction. I think you're standing in line of faithfulness. And it's a hard step, and our hearts are with you. I think so. But uh, the Lord is going with you, and the Lord will settle you. And I trust, even though we don't want it that way, it will be a greater blessing for you. We want that for you. I mean, we don't want to lose you. Right. <laughs> He'll put you in the right place and the right church and everything. We'll see you on the You know, <laughs> I will say this much, and I will say it carefully, because you'll catch what I'm saying. But there's one on your heart that you're praying for, and maybe it's this move to bring out that answer to prayer. That would make it worth everything. Yes. That would make it worth anything you left behind. I know you'd have no arguments. So, but sorry, folks. I just realized. I mean, I had to address that face. I saw that, you know, and I thought I got to address it because I didn't want there to be a, a missed message here. Um, but for Isaac, it was a, a correction. You need to get back. You need to get back into where you'll be in fellowship with the Lord. You need to not be living close to the world. And for all of us, all of us, remember 2 Timothy, or was it 1 Corinthians, whichever one it was that, you know, I think it's 2 Timothy, that, you know, when you think you're going to stand, look out because that's where you'll fall. Yes. So just put your strength and your trust in the Lord. Walk it with Him. Let Him shore you up so you don't, you know, misstep. So Isaac does depart. He departs and he camps in the valley of Gerar. So he didn't go far, folks. He went from Gerar to the valley of Gerar, but he's on his way. He's starting to move. Um, he's going to find that he's going to continue to have problems until he gets where God wants him to be. And sometimes that is how God has to move us. We have to have problems or we wouldn't move. We do become settled and we do become 
sometimes complacent and, and other times again that's not the reason but Isaac did go west I'm sorry he went east <laughs> he went east on the map and he went a little farther up the valley so he's a little more removed from Egypt okay but we're going to see there's still problems here and I think we can go just a few more verses. Well, let, let's see if we can get them out of some of this trouble. So verse 18, Yitzhak dug again the wells of water, which had been dug in the days of his father, Abraham. So he's still living on land that his dad lived on. There were wells that, that his dad or his servants, his father's servants, had dug. And um, Isaac, is, is they've been, they were stopped up after the death of Abraham probably so that Isaac wouldn't settle there. The people probably feared Abraham, but now with Abraham um, departed, it's like we're not going to make it a nice area for Isaac to live in. So they had stopped them up. They didn't need them. They didn't want them, and they wanted to discourage settlement there. So Abraham, I'm sorry, Yitzhak now comes into that area, and he's going to start digging up those same wells. Now, when we remember that Isaac is a picture of Messiah, we can see that when Messiah came, he reopened the well of living water. It had been blocked up by ritual, it had been blocked up by ceremony, it had been blocked up by the Pharisees, putting so much on the law that the people couldn't keep it. You know, they were getting so far away from what God said and so far into what man said. And Yeshua came and said, I'm the living water. Drink from my well of salvation. You'll never thirst again. He offered that to the Samaritan <clears throat> woman when he was sitting at Yaakov's well. You're beginning to get the idea who dug the well that Yeshua was sitting at in John chapter 4? Jacob. Jacob. It's still called that to this day. And you can still drink from that well to this day. So... Um, so we can see the, the picture of it, but Isaiah, uh, Isaac, I'm sorry, is a man of wells. We saw, and I've got to go back in my notes, I brought the page, what did I do with it? Maybe it's down here, because um, I don't remember all of these. Okay, where did I put it? Where did I put it? It's, I'm sure, yeah, here we go, right here. Okay, when we were all the way back in um, chapter 24, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got the wrong page. Maybe I'm going to stop here and pick this up next week so I don't make a mess out of it. <laughs> what I want to do is take us back. It, it should be, I think I print, reprinted the wrong page. Let me look real quick here. Um, I think I can get it because I don't remember all the names that we talked about the whales extensively. This is chapter 24. Sorry, folks. I know I have it right here, and I saw to it that I had it, and I put everything together. Okay, I'm going to come back to it, because I don't want to just keep messing it up. And I've got the wrong page number down, or I can't see it, because I keep looking, and it tells me it's supposed to be on this page for my notes, and it is not. So So the herdsmen that were quarreling over the water, uh, Isaac and... Who was the other family that herdsmen were quarreling over the water? The Philistines. Oh. They were, and I just found it. Thank you. Your question gave me the time I needed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the Philistines were the ones that they were arguing over. They, they wanted Isaac out of this area. So they're still living in that area that, that on the map later is called Philistia. Um, but it, it's the Gaza area today. When you see Gaza and hear about it in the news, it's that area today. Okay, back in chapter 24, verse 62, when Isaac was associated with the wells, we saw the well called Lohoiroi, remember that name? That was um, actually, I'm sorry, that one goes all the way back to Hagar, Genesis 16, 14, the living one who sees me. What my point in this is the names of the wells had meaning. So when Hagar was running because Sarah was treating her roughly, God sent Hagar back and told her, you're pregnant, but, you know, he was going to take care of her. We saw later it called Beer Lahoy Roy. Um, we saw that it came in association with Abraham. And we saw in that that this area became known as Beersheba, the, the well of the seven, the seven wells or the oath. 
either word for beer, and Sheva is seven. So what we were seeing was God enters into promise. He makes an oath with Abraham. Isaac's going to come into that same area with the wells, and he's going to come into the oath and the promise God made to Abraham. We read that earlier in this chapter, that God was faithful to give it to Isaac because he promised it to Abraham. Now we're going to see the other names of the wells, and their names all, again, still have meaning. So Isaac's known for his life around the wells. Um, I say that, and I won't get to it all today, but um, um, Abraham was known, I'm kind of ruining this, but maybe it is a peak preview for you. Abraham, when we look at him, we see repeatedly he built altars to the Lord. Isaac, when we overview his life, we see he was a man of the wells. And Jacob, we're going to see, was a man of the tents, T-E-N-T-S, that, that we see it, it talk about him with tents, you know, repeatedly, just so we're getting an overall. And in this, we see that when the altar of the Lord is, is built in our lives, the presence of the Lord is there. We're worshiping the Lord and we're honoring the Lord. And where the wells are, we're finding that peaceful refreshment that's found in fellowship with the Lord when we're right and worshiping with Him. And the tent was the nomadic life. We're not settling in this world. We're not of this world. We're looking for the city that's made without hands in heaven, our eternal home. So in all three, we see we, when we worship the Lord, we are refreshed by Him and he has a home for us. That's what I want, want us to see as we follow through in these three men's lives, but we'll come back to that when it means even more. But at this point, Isaac's being associated with the wells, and here we go now into what I can do quickly. What was uh, the tents? What was the tents? Yeah. That's the nomadic lifestyle, not, not living in this world. We're not of this world. We don't settle in this world. It's not, our citizenship's not of this world. We're looking for the city made without hands, the heavenly Jerusalem, which is our eternal home. Did you just put that in one word? <laughs> in one word? I got, um, I got altars or worship, wells or refreshment. Okay, and, and the tent is, after. I would say, not of this world. Okay. How's that? Not of this that, world. That's good. Yeah, they we're just after. camping, folks. And one day we're going to put down permanent, but we're camping right now. And we need to camp in the right places too. What though. chapter was it? it? That's looking over their lives. Mm. You know, so you'd, you'd have to go from chapter 12 to about chapter 36 because well, it's kind of an well, overview. Well, okay. Yeah, we'll come back to it. We'll revisit it. It'll mean more as you go on. But it's just a good analogy for us as we're seeing the lessons, what we're learning from Isaac today. Here's an overview that you're learning in that way also. So he comes to the, the, where he digs up the wells of his dad, and it says in verse 19, but when Isaac's servants dug in the valley, oh, oh no, let me get back. I missed it. Uh, they, he stopped them up. He gave them the same names. I'm in verse 18. He gave them the same names which his father had given them. Okay, and we'll get those names in a moment, but he's in essence declaring, these were my father's wells. We have a right to these wells also because I'm my father's son. So he wasn't taking something that was the Philistines. This was the area that Avimelech gave Abraham, said, you can have whatever you want. You can stay wherever you want, you know, be blessed in my land. So Isaac's just coming into that area. Again, it's closer where God wanted him. He's moving back in the right direction, but we're going to see... Uh, that those the, the wells he digs up, it, it's not over. Let me just say that. Let me read you the in-between, which is verse 19. When Isaac's servants dug in the valley, found there a well of flowing water. Okay, there, And I'll come back to this because I'm rushing. I, shouldn't, I should have just stopped when I said that. Sorry, folks. But um, what I want you to see is um, the, the flowing water is like a spring that was springing up. It would be like an artesian well. It wasn't a cistern. It wasn't stagnant water. It was flowing water. 
Um, and that's very, very important in our spiritual life, of course. We need to be drinking from the well. That's, the Lord said, you'll never thirst again. It's constantly flowing. What we're going to see, and I'll come back to it next week, is we're going to see the other wells called dispute or contention. They're called um, hatred or opposition. We're going to see the other wells that Avram had dug that they're still issued. The Philistines are going to fight Isaac every step of the way. They're going to keep buffeting him. Finally, Isaac's going to move to the area where God wants him. In that area, he comes back to the wells at Beersheba where God made oath with Abraham. This is up more in the land and where God wanted him to be rather than on the outskirts of the world where he and his progeny could easily fall into the tribulations of the world. So once again, just like Abraham got corrected by a heathen ruler, Isaac gets corrected by a heathen ruler and keeps getting buffeted by the heathen Philistines until he finally gets himself where the Lord wants him. So, sorry, I didn't mean to make a mess of it at the end. We'll go back and we'll see it again, but I wanted you to get that whole overall so that you see, you know, God is faithful, even when we're not. We can make a mistake, and God doesn't say it's over, but we will suffer consequences. It won't be comfortable with us. We won't be enjoying the presence of the, well, the blessings of the Lord, because the Lord's presence is always with us. But you want to be receiving his blessings. You want to feel the overflowing, refreshing waters. You've got to be right with the Lord and where he wants you. So... I hope that encourages you, strengthens you. You know, we want to build our altars. We want to have our wells of living water, and we don't want to settle in this world. It's not good if you're getting complacent, you're getting comfortable in the world. That's a red flag. Okay, so this just a passing through. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so go ahead. The altars were worshipped, and that was Abraham. Yes. The wells were refreshment uh, and Isaac. that was Isaac mm -hmm. and the tents were Jacob. Yes, and that he didn't settle in this world, not of this world. He, no, awesome. Isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? That's why I wanted to get it. I wanted it. I will. I will repeat it. It'll come out as we develop in our lives because we're gonna look we're gonna continue to see, you know, the spiritual downfalls but the, the coming back up also. Again, God's never done with us because we make a mistake. He okay, never doesn't yet. allow us <laughs> to make Amen. the U-turn. He never says it's over. He, there's always room to get, make that U-turn, get back right with the Lord, and come into the fullness of his blessings. So just encourage anyone wherever you are on that walk. If you're in the blessings, stay in the blessings. And that doesn't mean that you don't have trials, you don't have tribulations. It's what you do in them. You know, if Isaac had turned to the Lord, if Abraham had turned to the Lord, neither one of them would have headed down to Egypt. If they didn't go down there, they wouldn't have met somebody who wanted their wives. <laughs> okay? Yeah. You know, it's really beautiful is just to know that, you know, even though they're making their mistakes, but to know their enemy is such, they, they, don't, they don't want to mess with their God. But yet they won't serve their God, but they don't want to mess with Right, right. It, the, she's speaking of Abimelech and the Philistines and the others. They knew better than to mess with Abraham and Isaac's God. They respected their God. But yes, yeah, sadly, they didn't come into the right fellowship with their God because there were those who did, you know, as we move on. Even when Israel comes out of Egypt, there was mixed company that came out with them. There were those who knew, hey, I want to follow that God. I want to follow the God of Israel. And they were allowed. They were the proselytes that, that were allowed in. So, Are there any other questions, comments? I feel like I threw a mess at the end. I, again, I'll clarify it next week if you're confused. But any questions or comments? I saw a few hands move. I thought they were going for their mics, but maybe not. <laughs> okay. All right. I know my... Rowena does. Rowena does. Okay. Go ahead, Rowena. Yeah. First, I know this Rosie says hello, Rosie. You, you came on late. Yes. Glad you saw her. In the... uh, Rochelle, could you clarify again the Philistines from that time to the Palestinians at this time, that they are two separate group of people. Right. The Philistines actually die off. We don't have a continuation of them. 
we do have in their area a continuation of Arab peoples. And the Philistines probably would, would have been of, um, they weren't of, of what becomes called the Jewish descent. So even though the name was brought back to life, quote, called Palestine, Palestina, close to Philistina, it was just a slur, your first enemies, we're going to finish what they didn't do. They tried to wipe you out, they didn't manage it, we're going to do it. So that's why they used the name. But the people that are calling themselves Palestinian today are of Arab descent, but if they trace back their roots, out of Esau came ten nations that are Arab nations, and there are more that, that came off of those. So you even have Esau called the Edomites, and the Edomites are the area of Edom and Moab. They're the area um, a little east of where we're talking right now, but not that far away. They're probably cousins of the Edomites, but they're not, there's, there's no, you can't follow those people through. And even when they came, they were a sea people that came and stopped in the land. It was not their land first. The, the earliest Settlers in the land we learn about are those that we read about in chapter 15, those 10 that God named there and said, you know, they're the ones in the land, but I'm going to thrust them out and you will receive this land. Not one of those was named Philistine. Not one. You know, they were all given other names. So, does that clarify it? Yeah. Okay. okay. And the Philistines at that time were living towards the, the big sea, the Mediterranean? Yes. Yes. And yes. the Palestinians now are in like the, in the western part. Right. On the other side. Yes. Yeah. 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 You are praying. Thank you. you You're welcome. Pray. What? You are praying. Yeah, pray. Okay. Before I ask if there's any other questions or comments, I'll close and pray fast so my people who need to scoop can. Lord God, thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that even when we make mistakes, you are faithful. Thank you that you give us room for repentance. You give us room to turn around and come back. But Lord, we do want to stay close to you. We want to drink at your well. We want to be satiated and pleasing to you always. So hold us close. And may we be quick to turn at any correction that it not need to be a great reprovement, but that we are easily corrected, that we might be useful to you, that we might glorify you, that we might serve the purpose you have us in this time and age for because, Lord, you are working all things. You are in control of this entire world and where it's headed. And thank you, Lord, in the final, we see the victory in the holy name of Yeshua Jesus, who will rule and reign, and this earth then will know shalom. Thank you, Lord. We praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you for your unfailing love. And we praise you that it extends to us even when we did nothing to deserve it and really did not deserve it. Still, you you called us, you chose us, and you are the faithful one. And we praise you forever in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.